Hey guys, welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I'm Nerdarchus Ryan, and today I'm joined by Nerdarchus Ted, Mike Dunlap. And today we're going to have talk about D&D on the high seas with Armada Games. Hey guys, jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter. It's a great way to get gaming tips as well as learn how to game with Nerdarchy. So uh, today we're pleasantly uh, joined by. Oh, Mike Dunlap of Armada Games out of Tampa, Florida. So we got a ta a Tampa, Florida, Armada, Armada Games here on a boat. We're in Key West, Florida right now. Uh, the Fantasy Cruise where we're going to, yes. to Key, from Tampa to, to Key West and then to Cozumel and then back again, a Hobbit's Journey. Uh, so we're actually at your table where you're going to be later running Adventure League today. Sure am. Looking forward to it. Yeah. It should be a lot of fun. D&D &D on a boat. Yeah, D&D so, on a boat. Now, now, you've told us uh, uh, off camera that you do a lot of con running games and Adventure League, and that you've run the fifth edition campaign source books. Oh yeah, yeah, we um, we've done several of the big conventions in Tampa, and that's sort of how we got invited to, to go here. Okay. Uh, the people putting this show on <clears throat> saw that we did some pretty good stuff in the conventions uh, locally, and said, "Hey, you want to come do it on a boat?" And we said, "Sure." Great. Uh, is there, since you said you've run all of the modules, is there a particular favorite that you, you enjoy going back to, or? Uh, right now, I just finished running all of this Curse of Strahd modules, all the Season 4 stuff, and I really love those. There's some really fun ones in there, dealing with uh, the Vistani, like they're, they're sort of gypsy people that travel mm -hmm. around. Uh, there's one I really like where this uh, the Vistani leader gives this whole speech about uh, part of their culture, and it's you know it, it hooks into the adventure like clearly the speech is directed at the players and they're supposed to take away from that and they need to help these people for this reason uh but it's really fun to do and you get to make you know some fun the fun accents and we are the Vistani and we are a cultural people and you know you get to have a lot of fun with it it's just really cool yeah i guess real quick too what we might want to do for the folks at home is uh if you're not familiar with what adventure league is could you give us like a quick cliff notes sure. version of that yeah so adventure leagues is a really really neat idea where Sometimes it's hard to find a D&D game, you know, you, maybe you're out of Some town of our viewers might, yeah, may right. not very well know that, yeah. So what Adventures League did, and they've been doing this now for a couple of uh, iterations of D&D, &D, is it's a global campaign where you create a character using the, the uh, not dice rolling, but the point by system out of the book. And there's a few rules that go along with it. Uh, so your character is created on a balanced level with everyone else's characters. And you can play these characters in Adventure League's adventures literally anywhere on the planet. As long as you're in the right level range and that character hasn't played the adventure before, you sit down at a table and you play through the adventure. Your character grows, gets money, experience, magic items, all the fun stuff. You get to kill some monsters, save the damsel, whatever you want to do in the game, and go on to your next one. And you don't have to worry about, well, my character didn't play the last one of these people, so can I not play this now? No, play. Play in your heart's content. Have fun. Right, so it becomes very much more like an epic, sidic adventure as opposed to an ongoing campaign. Although, like, yeah. you, you kind of have that little bit of looseness of just, you kind of just game with who you have around at that time. So yeah. maybe there's some inconsistency of who you're adventuring with, but magic. You, you, <laughs> you do have to deal with some of that, that, well, I, I appeared in this campaign right. setting, in this campaign setting, but if you are happen to be in, a, in an area that you can't find, a local gaming group that's going to meet on a regular basis but there's a gaming shop that happens to run adventure league then you've got the ability to get in there get this done and not have to finagle with oh i'm just not going to game because i can't find a group of people or yeah. it gives you the in-person experience versus a roll 20 or uh, other online it, it does yeah. like there's a lot to be said for sitting around a table with people i know i love video games as much as the next guy that loves nerdy stuff but it, you, you can't be just rolling a die and using pen and paper and well there's it just there's something about it you just you can't get away from it we we've done a, a number of online games both on our own channel as well as on you know just regular stuff and it is absolutely a different experience when yeah. you're at the table there's a lot more camaraderie there's also the, the the higher chance of more out of character things oh yeah so it's a give and take but i wouldn't i wouldn't replace my at the table experience for a virtual always table. doing virtual the, the problem with a virtual tabletop too is just lag like you can't have as organic of conversations between characters because it's like oh there's a slight delay or you can't over speak one another whatsoever because also, the way virtual tabletops are also social cues yeah it's harder it's harder to figure out all right what is that person's speaking pattern 
when are they gonna just stop? When can I get in there to say this or to say that? And in role playing, sometimes timing is crucial. I want to say the right thing at the right time to affect that NPC. Body language can also be a big one, like how you say things and how you move and how you mm -hmm. do stuff. Like, and uh, if you've got just the, the camera on the face as opposed to the, the whole body, your posture is even going to dictate some of that stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely. The online gaming is really cool, really fun. It's a great uh, option venue that's out there now for mm -hmm. people. You can even do Adventures League uh, through you know, the virtual tabletops. Um, so it's a really cool thing to live in a world where if you want to play D&D &D and you just can't get to a, to a table somewhere, you can at least log on and probably find a game. It's just a great time to be into this stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, from learning how to play to consuming it as entertainment, like we live in kind of the height. Oh, and then all the Kickstarter options of, <laughs> I want to see this game exist in the world. So there, there it is, because I can just help that happen. Um, so you did mention the point of the material in Venture League tends to, um, to to sort of go hand in hand with like the latest book to drop, a Curse of Strahd or whatever. So, does that material like you could basically use it as side quests within the, the say you get the source book Curse of Strahd or um, or Horde of the Dragon Queen, whatever the current season is? Does it seem like it would go smoothly that you could kind of spi sprinkle some of that throughout your campaign if you wanted to oh, add sure. in elements? Oh, sure, sure. Adventure League stuff is um, it's really portable. Yeah. Uh, it's great just to have around as source material. If you're ever looking for a random encounter or you just need an adventure hook idea, you could easily adapt the stuff into a homebrew game. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the books uh, also have ways to adapt parts of the book into Adventure League. They have uh, like these adaptive, mo adaptive modules where it's run these sections, do it this way, and this counts as an Adventure League adventure in addition to the stuff that they publish for you. So it kind of, it ports both directions to, to just give a lot of versatility what you can do with the material. Yeah, like in the, in technology, it's like being backward compatible or something <laughs> like that, yeah. It's like Wonka Vader compatible, up, <laughs> down, left, right, forward, <laughs> back, it, nice. it goes all directions. Abacab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, with, yeah. uh, with you running at conventions and the like, do you have any either glorious stories where you know something happened that was utterly amazing, or something that was just utterly horrible that you know? Just yeah, has to we be we can have the awesomely oh inconceivable gosh. and the terrible inconceivable. Maybe. So yeah, so this year at MetroCon, we uh, we slightly modified one of the early adventures for. Uh, for Curse of Strahd. Uh, each, each season starts with this little, little five-part mini-adventure where each one gets you like a hundred experience points and it's really geared towards people who have never played D&D before. Uh -huh. it's, it's super bite-sized. It's supposed to take about an hour and go through it. And while we are playing this one, we modified it a little bit for the convention to make it play through even quicker and smoother. And uh, there's this, this scene where you have to go up a, a hill and the hill's covered in ice and there's these bushes on, on the hill. And the bushes have flowers on them. There's no no ice on the bushes. So you're like, well, that's weird. There's no ice on the bushes, but they're covered in snow. There's ice everywhere. And you have to make checks to climb because it's slippery and you fall. And so a uh, player tumbles and falls into one of these bushes and gets some of these, these flowers stuck to them. They're thorny flowers. Like, okay, well, neat. Pulls one off, no big deal. Pulls the other one off, no big deal. And I'm making checks. So you have to make checks when this happens. So he's cool. Everything's fine. The players are convinced these bushes are perfectly safe. Next guy rolls up, does the same thing, slips into the bush, only this time when he picks the flower up, he fails the check. It turns out these flowers explode like alchemist fire if, if you fail the check. Oh, wow. uh, so now all of a sudden the players, for the next like 30 minutes, they're afraid to touch this hill. Yeah. But they have to go up the hill and continue the adventure. They're like, is there workarounds? Like, well, we could, we could talk about ways around the hill maybe. But, like, but the guy we're falling went up that hill and there's bushes that explode up this hill and it's just... The, it was fun watching a group of people who barely played the game before face their first real like, holy cow, what do we do moment. It's Logic puzzle, because you're like, there's yeah. no dialogue box for me to choose what I'm going to do, because this isn't a video game RPG. Uh, right. And like the, the hill is also set up to give them extra weapons later. So they, they grab the flowers, the flowers it's an explosive. alchemist fire, it's like throwing firebombs at the ice monster at the end. So uh, some of them did think of that, which is really awesome. But it's good times. I always like watching new players as they, they approach the game and, and actually start getting into it and start thinking about what's happening and, and they get they get a little more comfortable at the table. It's, it's a great experience. Yeah, so actually if you want to talk about like how new players 
come to the game via a Adventure League? Like, how does it seem they even like filter into areas? Is it the game conventions primarily, or is it people that happen to come to your shop? Like, how does that tend to work for you, bringing new people into the hobby? Um, it's a lot of just being available for the people. Like at the conventions, we try to do nice setups and, and get some eye-catching things going on. Uh, and again, we're in a in a world where it's not necessarily uncool to play D and D anymore. Like maybe everyone plays D and D now. <laughs> Celebrities, Vin Diesel plays D and D. Yep. So it's it's you can play D and D and be just fine. And the number of people that walk by, like, oh, you're running D and D this weekend. That's great. That D and D on the cruise. <laughs> like heck yeah, it is. At conventions, the store, it's really the same thing. People come in, ask questions, and you know, it's like, well, you played you know Final Fantasy. Have you played anything like any games like that on computers? You played World of Warcraft? Sure. All right. Well, here's a way you can play it. But you were going to use more of your imagination instead of just a computer with limited processes. You can do literally anything you want. And even if it's not in the rules, the rules tell you to make up a way to make it happen. So it's, the, rule, the rules are malleable enough. Yeah, more like guidelines. Have fun. Yeah, <laughs> loose guidelines yeah. sometimes. Yeah, play yeah. and have fun. That's the, the biggest thing. And once you get someone to sit down and become comfortable and, and really get into the whole. I am this other character. It's it's again. It's just such such a fun thing to, to behold and be part of. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, getting back to the sort of uh, being an owner of, of a shop. How long have you been doing uh, that? Like how long have you owned your store? And... Uh, this October we celebrated our ten year anniversary. Oh cool! So it's really Positive cool. Top. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much. It's been a long ride, and you know, being the owner of a business, you think you know you own a, a game and hobby store, and you sell like. Dungeons and Dragons books and miniature figures and card games and it's just all games all the time but we do it's a lot of work it's a lot of stress yeah. it's a lot of long nights uh, owning a business is is super stressful but in the end of the day I get to play games and, and sell toys to grown ups so you know that's <laughs> that's, fantastic. that's I, you know, I, I I can't complain too much about having to do a little work every now and then. Yeah, we, right? we, we did a little bit of research uh, on Armada Games before we came here, you know, knowing that this was the the gaming central of, of what our cruise was going to be, and like the the pictures that you have up on, on Facebook and stuff, it shows that you have things that are really hopping. You got events that are running all the time. Oh yeah. So like. We, we have a very active calendar on our website. Yeah, we have clearly. like 30 plus events a week scheduled. We do a lot of social community based events. Like, uh -huh. uh, we have a local renaissance fair that comes to town every year. We nice. actually shut the store down for a day and invite people to come with us to the Ren Fair. Nice. And do things like that. When, uh, when uh, Star Wars Episode 7 came out, we rented a theater and took 120 of our uh, regulars out to watch Star Wars with us. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Incredible. It was that's cool. so cool. It was yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's the thing too. Like, uh, sure, you have to do all the marketing stuff to run a business. You have to keep the stuff on shelves and order it. But I really think in this day and age, when like it's it's harder for brick and mortar stores, uh, that really what you're building and selling is community, like a place to do totally, the thing. Totally. It's uh, we've got uh, like half of our store are just tables to play games on. And, and it's just, I've made some of the best friends I've had in my entire life doing it. Uh, my partners, uh, were, we were friends going into it, and since then my circle of friends has just expanded greatly. And I love it, because I've never been a super social guy. Uh, but when, you, when you're in a group of people and you all have the same common interests, it's much easier yeah, just it to be. So much and, yeah, and we, we've done videos on, on that particular topic as well, about how, how difficult it is for Know, the, those those that have these oddities and these hobbies to okay well I'm gonna go interact well D and D kind of bridges that and oh, yeah, when yeah, you can yeah. it's like oh I have that hobby too well you don't have to worry as much because when you're having that conversation you both like the same thing you don't have to worry about oh he likes D and D I'm gonna judge him right. no it's, no yeah. no it, uh, it's it's really awesome to be able to go out and, and do stuff and you know head to your local game store and play D&D &D and maybe you'll have dinner with your friends afterwards and just your, your conversation, your chit chat, it's like, you know, what happened on the latest DC TV show, what happened on our last D&D adventure, what happened in the last, you know, Marvel movie, <laughs> like, like, you just, it's just the topics, it's the things we're all into, it's just all the nerdy, nerdy stuff. Things. Yeah, exactly. So is there anything else that you, uh, you know, you feel like sharing about the, either the con experience or the Adventure League? Uh, the convention experience is a lot of fun. Um, Certainly, uh, things like Adventure League, where it's a scripted module adventure, aren't for everyone. But I would encourage everyone to try it at least once. It's a lot of fun. Like anything, you got to get the right people at the right table. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really neat experience. 
I've had a lot of people sit down at my tables at conventions where they're like, well, we play homebrew only, but I'm just looking for something to do for the next hour. I'm like, sure, man, sit and have fun. And then like, I didn't realize it would be like this. I yeah. thought it was going to be, you know, something different. I'm like, yeah, D&D, man. We're playing D&D. We're rolling dice. Right. We're killing orcs. We're, we're doing <laughs> what we do, you know? Nice. Yeah, yeah. However, you like to play that game. That, that could be that. It could be that version of the game yeah. instead of the convention. I'm a firm believer. There's no wrong way to play D and D as long as everyone on the table is having fun. You yes. want a power game. You want a super role play. Whatever you want to do. You want to toss the rule book out the window. And I watched a guy run a game in my store for three years, where he would have literally, he had a D20. He had no rule books. He had nothing. He asked his players when they started the game to just describe their characters and tell him what things they were good at. Everybody got a couple things they were good at. And he ran this game for like three years. And, and, and all he had was D D20. And whenever he decided that something needed to roll, he just, all right, that's what happened. There you go. And it was just the most amazing thing to watch. And I'm like, there's literally no system here. But everyone's <laughs> enjoying There's like 12 people playing yeah. every week. I, this is great. I ran a, a slightly similar thing back during the, the 3.5 days. And I don't know how much you get into novels, but... Uh, Dark Sun had a series called Tribe of One, and it was essentially, uh, you've got one guy who's got multiple personality disorder, essentially. Oh, jeez. And that sounds I, awesome. I ran that as a campaign. The players were the personalities, essentially. Yes. Yeah. And there was one guy who made a full-fledged character. Everybody else you know, told me, okay, this is what I am, this is what I want to do. And we didn't roll damage dice. We, you know, there was only ever the d20 was used, and it was only if I thought there was a situation that it would call into question, or if two personalities were vying for control of the body. That's super awesome. I had, a, I actually ran a character once in a game. I, I convinced a DM uh, to let me do it, where I couldn't decide if I want to play a rogue or a sorcerer in this game. It's like, hey, can I play this character with split personality? I'll take like you know the lower hit points and and we'll, we'll, we'll figure all this stuff out, but like, he's a rogue normally, and the rogue is a typical rogue guy, but when he gets hurt, he his alternate personality kicks in, and it's just like this angry sorcerer that, the sorcerer's aware of the rogue, the rogue's not aware of the sorcerer, <laughs> and the sorcerer thinks the rogue is weak and needs to protect him and defend him, and you know, flip-flops this, this multiple personality character. Nice. That sound, sounds like a really fun, it was a good, good character to run. All right, so uh, you know, thank you so much for well, for, for sharing this, uh, you know, with with our audience here. It's a lot of fun for running games <laughs> and hanging out with us on a boat. Uh, so <laughs> if you guys have played Adventure League or want to, maybe looking for a shop down your uh, in your area, put uh, your comments and suggestions down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.